See, okay, you're live, guys. This is Dean Evans, and this is the talk. Oh, no, it might be back to front. Never mind. Okay, we'll just hope it works. There we go. Sorry? I don't think so. Yes, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Don't think I'm that clever. No, but I could come to that. <laughs> Hang on. Really, it's more to capture what you're saying in a way. No, this isn't touch screen. No. Do you think that's okay? I mean, if we get your words and what's going on. I know, but never mind. Never mind. It's the pictures will look good. It's just a recording. Colin, smile on. <laughs> I don't think we need anything else, do we? Oh, we're talking to Joe. It's easier. me to talk again and it's been what it's been 12 years has it since we spoke about uh, oh, really? 2016 how was it oh, yeah no no 20 20 no it wasn't oh, it was, it was, it was, it was after 2014 yeah. we met yeah. at blackwater and that oh, and i think our show was 2016 right okay. really. but anyway yeah, i'm sorry i'm late i got lost and then i couldn't park but, uh, <laughs> here we are and I write everything down because I've got a shocking memory. Um, so this morning, I would like to share with you my passion for the life of this chap, John Passmore Edwards. Passmore Edwards was born in a, a small Cornish village. He was educated at the local school and he was born nearly 200 years ago. That's why we're looking at him now. And he had an ambition to be useful. That was his life ambition, was to be useful. And I would like to show you this morning just how useful he was and what amazing things he did in his life. There was a satirical magazine around at the time called Punch, and Punch wrote, Oh, Passmore Edwards, you beyond contention are worthy of, pumpkin, of Punch's honourable mention. There's scarce a project schemed with kindly sense, but profits by your large benevolence. A famous actor at the time said, called him Mr. Greatheart, and he was often referred to as the Cornish Carnegie. Yet yeah, Andrew Carnegie, who was probably the, well, at least the second richest man in the world, he, he said he was a disciple of Pastor Edwards, and he called him Saint Passmore, because it, he said if he'd been born just a hundred years earlier, he would have been made a saint. So John Passmore Edwards then was born in Blackwater, which is a small village halfway between Truro and Redroof. And his father, William Edwards, he was a carpenter in the village, and his mother was called Susan Passmore before they were married. And she was the daughter of a person who made saddles, horses saddles, from Newton Abbott in, in uh, Devon. And he grew up with three brothers, William, Richard, and James. And he also mentioned a small brother and a sister that had died when they were both children. Initially, the family lived in this small four-room cottage in the village which obviously wasn't big enough for this growing family. So his father, he borrowed some money and he built a larger house nearby. It's the one nearest the railway bridge there. And he obtained a license to brew beer. And he not only brewed beer and sold it to the 
beer, beer houses and public houses in the, in the neighbourhood, but they serve beer from the house as well. So the brewery, which is probably the, the lean-to, right on the end of the building, so that was probably the brewery, and so it was a, being a major part of family life at that time. And the boys were expected to help their father work in the brewery when they were quite small. But quite remarkably, Passmore Edwards didn't drink for most of his life, and neither did one of his brothers. And they later campaigned on the evils of drink. Mm -hmm. Edwards tells us that that house, although it had eight rooms, it didn't have eight windows. At that time, the government taxed the number of windows in the house. Mm -hmm. So if you had more than six windows, you received quite a large tax. And so the bedrooms at the back of the house where the boys slept, there was no window at all. It was total darkness. The only window was a very small pane at the top of the stairs just so they could get up, up the stairs. And his father rather discouraged them from reading in the daytime when, it was, when there was work to be done. So it was in the evening by the light of the candle that the boys could read. And Edwards wrote everything he could get, or read everything he could get his hand on. His only schooling was at the little Dame School. Now, this is the building, it's obviously fallen down since and it's gone now, but that was the size of the school. <coughs> and all the children of all the ages sat on a long, one long bench, oh. sat like that, oh, listening yeah. to the teacher. Now, the teacher, he wasn't a qualified teacher. He'd been an ex miner and had been injured in the mines and obviously needed to earn his living, so he became a teacher. But fortunately, Pascal Edwards' father was one of the few men in the village that bought a weekly newspaper, and Edwards would read this from cover to cover. You'll see, you probably can't read it, but the title, The Penny Magazine, then underneath it, it says, the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. <laughs> and this was where Edwards got his idea that he wanted to be useful. At the age of 12, now children left school at the age of 12. <coughs> so at the age of 12, he left school and he went to help his father, who by now had created a garden around the cottage and he made it a, a soft fruit garden. And young Jack, he would go and help to tend the plants and pick the fruit and would take the fruit into the market, into Redruth, Truro, St Agnes, six, eight miles away to sell the fruit at the market. And he obviously earned a, a little bit of money for doing this and he saved up the pennies that he earned and he would walk the 12 miles into Truro so that he could buy a single book from the second hand bookshop. A little bit older, just a teenager, he started becoming a Sunday school uh, superintendent. And along with a school friend, John Simons, they started a, a small school in the evenings and Sunday mornings for the men and boys that couldn't read and write, but couldn't afford the penny a week that it cost to go to the day school. And Edwards quite, he wrote that in later life, Amongst his most treasured possessions were a few letters that he'd received from men and boys that had learned to read and write at that little school. In his life, he was obviously became very, very successful in later life. And in his life, he became a journalist, newspaper owner, probably the biggest newspaper owner of his time. He was a political reformer, he was a member of parliament. He was a peace activist, he would have been Van the Bomb of the day, and he was an anti-slavery campaign. Time, those times were a time of a huge amount of political and social reform. A lot going on at that time, and Edwards would have been seen right in the middle of a lot of it. And when he learned to sell his fortune, he started to give it away. And in just 14 years, 71 public buildings were built as a direct result of his money. 
There were 20 buildings in Cornwall, and there were also in Devon, in Bournemouth, Newton Abbott, um, Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire, London, and in Kent, South East Kent, and in Essex. And he was responsible for building libraries, hospitals, convalescent homes where people, when they left hospital, they could go to recover. And there was uh, homes for orphanages, schools for disabled children, little village institutes, schools of art and science, art galleries and museums. And many of these buildings still remain to serve the communities that he gave them to. Is that one still open to you? <coughs> it's now part of the uh, University of East London. Uh, it's a student union building. <laughs> the Prime Minister of the time, Lord Asquith, he said that Edwards had done more, more than any single Englishman to help the people to equip and educate themselves for civic and social duties. Now, apart from calling him an Englishman, we can't argue. <laughs> Edwards preferred just to say, if I could fund the latter, mm. then the poor might climb it. Mm. As a young boy, he attended the Carr Harriet Literary Institute with his, his uncle uh, John, who lived in St. Day. And most of them would have been older, older boys and men. Uh, women weren't allowed in those days, they had a job to do at home. Uh, but young Passmore Edwards, he decided, he told them he was going to, um, they obviously had talks at the Institute, and he said he would like to give a talk, and he chose as his subject, the poetry of the creation. But later he said he knew very little about poetry, and even less about the creations. But he wrote out what he was going to say, and he stood up in front of an audience that would have been all old enough to have been his father, and he read out his his prescribed script. He said that he was disappointed, he was dismayed, that it neither provided laughter nor applause, neither got a vote of censure nor a vote of thanks. While not to be beaten, he volunteered to talk to the St Agnes Young Men's Association at their annual meeting. And this time he decided to learn his speech by heart. So on the, on the evening, he stood up again, and he started well, but after a few minutes, the words had failed him, and he had to sit there. He composed himself, stood again and carried on, but it was no good, the words had gone, and he sat down, this time for a lot of laughter and ridicule. He said he went home uh, much wiser, but sadder than you. But not to be beaten, he, within a few years, he had accomplished his art of public speaking and he was giving talks to institutes in Truro and in the villages surrounding Truro. Now the Corn Laws in, were introduced to control the uh, supply of cheap grain into this country so that the grain prices remained high. And that meant that a lot of families found it very difficult to feed themselves. And there was a, a campaign group formed called the Anti Corn Law League. And Edward sent away for a pamphlet so that he could best understand what the issue was about. Well, he was very surprised that instead of just one leaflet, he got a whole parcel. And there was a letter that said, Could you please distribute these around the area? And he did. And he walked all the way down to Penzance distributing these leaflets over 20 miles. And that rather upset the mayor of Penzance. He was a magistrate. And he hauled him in and threatened him with prison for sedition. That means uh, upsetting the authorities. 
Uh, and that was no idle threat because there was a lot of unrest in the country at the time, and the authorities were trying to clamp down on these on these um, free radicals or free traders. But even with that threat ringing in his ears, he carried on distributing his leaflets. At the age of 19, <laughs> I always have to say that's not him at 19. <laughs> but the camera hadn't been invented then, so there's no photograph. So, but at the age of 19, he went to see a solicitor in Truro, and he was offered the job as an underclerk at the princely wage of, you know, what's it, £10 a year. £10 per year. <laughs> and he remained, he remained living at weekends with his parents' house in Blackwater. And he took rooms in Truro where we stayed during the week. And on Monday morning, he would walk the 12 miles, 8, 10, 12 miles into Truro. And he would take with him three of his mother's pasties for the first three days of the week. And he would either go home in the middle of the week or the carrier's cart would deliver another three pasties for his dinner for the rest of the week. And he said, with good bread and butter, it kept him in fine health. When, he, when the solicitor told him that there was no longer any work for him, he first of all went to see the West Britain newspaper, hoping to get a job as a freelance journalist. Well, they didn't want him. But fortunately, there was a man there who was the agent for a London newspaper. And he told him that they had a vacancy in Manchester for an agent there. And hearing about Passmore Edwards working for the Anti Cornwall League, he offered them this job at 40 pounds a year, quite a, a substantial increase. But this young man had to work out how he was going to get from Blackwater 300 miles up to Manchester. No easy task. His budget, rail traffic, or rail travel, was well outside his budget at the time. No super savers in 1840. Tamar Bridge hadn't been built in that time. So he sold a few of his books, and with the rest of his books in a carpet bag, no doubt made by his mother from a piece of stair carpet, he first walked into Falmouth, 12 miles, I think it's 12 miles, in this story, <laughs> 12 miles into Falmouth, and he caught a steamer to Dublin, and it was uh, 10 shillings, that's 50 pence, as deck passenger. He said it was the most miserable 48 hours of his life, huddled under a tarpaulin on the deck. From Dublin, he crossed the Irish Sea, much shorter journey, for three shillings, 15 pence. But this time there was a herd of pigs to company. <laughs> and they squealed all the way. So it was probably a, quite a leisurely railway trip from Liverpool into Manchester. But at that time, it would have been more like an open cattle truck. Than what we see today. When he was in Manchester, he went to lots of meetings and he sent back lots of reports to the London newspaper. But the newspaper wasn't a financial success. And although Edwards worked for them for 18 months in Manchester, he still only received about 10 shillings for his wages. But by now, he was a, quite an accomplished speaker and being teetotal, meaning he didn't drink, he could go around all the temperance halls, the people that believe that you shouldn't drink, and he would give them lectures on, on temperance. And he went to Manchester and Liverpool, into North Wales and Cheshire, giving these lectures just for a few shillings at a time. And that's how he managed to keep his head above water. Well. It was also in Manchester, he went to this building, which was called the Mechanics Institute, and he carried on his education a little bit. And at that time, there were two great reformers, Richard Cobden and John Bright, and he went to hear, to see, hear what they had to say. And this is in Manchester where his, his principles developed and matured. In 1840, Still only 22, he walked from, or he went from Manchester down to London, a bit like Dick Whittington, with just a few shillings in his pocket 
hoping to find his fame and fortune. He got a job as a publisher's clerk, and so he learned to trade. But he earned his money mainly by talking, lecturing, and his freelance writing for newspapers and magazines. Again, he, st he studied at the uh, Mechanics uh, Institute in London, which is now Birkbeck College. And he also became an active member of many of the <coughs> activist groups that were around at that time. And he campaigned the Society for the Abolition of Capital Punishment and the Political and Financial Reform Association, the Society for the Abolition of Tax on Knowledge, the Society for the Suppression of the Opium Trade, the Peace Society, and there was many, many more. Tax on Knowledge was because paper had a tax on it. So newspapers and books were taxed. Even the advert that went into the newspaper was taxed which made the cost of a newspaper six old pence, two and a half new pence now, which was way outside the, the uh, means of the average working man. In 1850, he was then 27, and he'd saved up 50 pounds. And he thought he would start his own little publication called The Public Good. He said, if I can write for others, then I might as well own my own magazine and write for myself. Well, he borrowed money for the printing costs and the paper, and he rented a little room in Paternoster Road, which is the main printing area in London at that time, four shillings a week. And there he acted as editor, author, publishing clerk, uh, advertising clerk. He even wrapped up and posted the magazines when they were sold. And in the evening, he slept on a little cot. But unfortunately, he, he sold this magazine very cheaply to, to attract the working classes, but there was no profit in it. There was no profit margin. So he started another magazine to, um, to, to prop up the first one, the Temperance Tract Journal. And when that didn't make a profit, he started another one called the Biographical Magazine. People in the Victorian times were mad keen. It was like the OK magazine of its time. So you know, told them all what was going on with the, the local celebs. There was also a, a children's encyclopedia in which they passed. There was a magazine about microscopes, and there was a poetry magazine. There was all sorts of publications that he was trying to get to make his profits. He also published a, a copy of the famous novel Uncle Tom's Cabin which was about slavery in, in America at the time. And he published it in weekly parts, a penny. So again, the working classes could afford it. And he was very active in the anti-slavery trade. And so he published another um, magazine. Sorry, I, I missed it. He was involved with the Peace Society and when their magazine got into financial difficulties, he acted as the editor and financed that as well. So we move back to this magazine called Uncle Tom's Companion, which was the story of some of the American slaves that had escaped from the southern states and made their way up to New York and safety. And unfortunately, he got all these magazines and publications being sold, but he still wasn't making a profit. And eventually he was owing several thousand pounds to the people that printed the, the uh, magazines. And in 1852, his cousin, William Barnes Passmore, who was also living in London, he received a letter from Passmore Edwards from White Cross Street Debtors' Prison. If you had a debt in those days, they put you in prison until you paid it. Well, unfortunately, his cousin hadn't got the money to pay, pay off his debts. But somehow they managed to get him out of prison and he went to live with friends nearby. At the time he was in prison, had a great effect on his health. He had a complete physical breakdown. By the time he was well again, all his magazines had been sold off, the titles had been sold off. He'd been declared bankrupt. But at least his creditors had decided, although they only got five shillings for every pound that they were owed, they decided that the fault hadn't been his own, 
and so they wrote off the rest of his debts. How long was he in prison? I don't know, probably months. Um, yeah, several months. That was enough to deteriorate. Yeah, I think that probably the amount of work he did do as well to try and keep his head above water, you know, and then just lose it all like that. And he told, when he wrote to his cousin, he said, don't tell your parents. No doubt he didn't want the story to get back to his own parents, but it's still down here in Cornwall. I don't understand how you're supposed to pay your debt on it. Yeah, that's the yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Remove the means to work. They did have to work in prison, didn't they? They did have to work in prison, but it wasn't enough to pay off the debt. Right. As soon as he was well again, he started to write, he started to give talks again, and uh, started to earn money. And uh, he vowed that he would pay off his debts in full. And he did this in, in 1866. He paid off all his creditors, actually with interest as well. And they were so surprised that they held a dinner in his honor. And they presented him with a gold watch because they'd never met, met a man who had been so sincere and paid off his debts. As he earned a little bit more money, he managed to buy the rights to this magazine called The English Mechanic. So it'd been a very popular magazine, but at that time wasn't making very much of a profit. And he bought it on what he said were easy terms, meaning he didn't have to pay for it up front. He could pay um, so much a month. And he also managed to buy another magazine called The Building News. Again, this has been a very popular magazine, it's a very successful ma magazine, but at that time wasn't making a profit. But with the skills that he had learned as a publisher's clerk, he managed to turn those both, both those magazines back into those successful publications. And those two magazines are at the base of his later wealth. He added to his portfolio a number of papers that he had, and 1870 bought the London Echo, which was the first halfpenny newspaper in the country. And there were others, there was one in Southampton and one in Portsmouth as well. And I've lost my place. <laughs> now, the Reform Act of 1867, uh, before 1867, only men with property could vote. And the Reform Act of 1867 extended the vote to another 400,000 working men. Uh, if they got a, a rent, a lease to a property, they didn't have to own it, they could then vote. And a lot of these voters in Truro, they formed the New Liberal Association, and they invited Passmore Edwards to come down to Truro to stand in the next general election to be their MP. At that time, Truro had two MPs, and Cornwall only has six now, but Truro had two MPs at that time. One was always a Liberal, and one was always a Tory. And quite often there wasn't a ballot, they just, that was how it was. Now these new voters thought that most of the new voters would be Liberal persuasion. And they thought that by putting in Passmore Edwards up as a candidate, they might get the two MPs to back her for Truro. Be liberal MPs, and then at least Truro would have a say in politics. Because at that time, when they got into the into Parliament, when a vote was called, one of them went into the eyes, one of them went into the nose, and they cancelled each, each other out. So Truro had no say in politics. These thought these new voters thought they could change that, but unfortunately, the votes failed to materialise. Now 
whether it was the old liberal voters thought that they might lose their city MP, whether it was because they thought he was too radical, he wanted too many changes, or whether it was because, as he said, the Tory landowners, they were coercing their employees to vote for them rather than to vote for the other side. We don't know. But it was 1881 before he again stood for Parliament, this time for Salisbury, and this time he was success successful. But unfortunately, the time in politics wasn't what he thought it was going to be, and uh, he was very disillusioned. He called the Houses of Commons the House of Waste, and he was forever seen walking in the corridors at night time, turning off the lights in unused buildings. <coughs> he was also very disappointed about the parliamentary system. He said there was very lots of very good men that stood for Parliament, but once they got in, they spent their time either to get a peerage to go up to the House of Lords or to promote their own commercial interests. So when his, his, uh, part, his party wrote to him, his local party wrote to him to complain that he hadn't supported them on their policy over Egypt, he wrote back and said, I've had enough of this, I'm going to stand, back, stand down at the next election, which was 1885. Throughout his life, he had a he had a name for philanthropy. Whenever there had been a natural disaster or a major accident, and there was a public um, list list of money being given to help, Edward's name would be right at the top of that list. He was always there giving his money. But it was that time after Parliament being in Parliament that for which he's most well known. He was already giving large numbers of books to those libraries that existed at that time. And in 1880, 18, 1889, the Vicar of Midia, which is the parish in which Blackwater stands, he wrote to Pastor Edwards and he asked him for a few books for a reading room that he wanted to open in the village for the working men. Pastor Edwards wrote back and said, well, not only will I give you 500 books, but if you can find a piece of land, I'll build you an institute as well. So on the 8th of August, 1890, was the opening of the first of the Passmore Edwards buildings at Marble. <coughs> the building had been built by his old school friend, John Simons, and uh, it was usual that Ed Edwards didn't just give them the money and get, let them get on with it. He expected the community to make some contribution uh, so that it was their institution, not his. It was either by providing the land or providing the furniture that went into the building. But Blackwater was so poor at the time that they couldn't even afford the 40 pounds to pay for the furniture. And Edwards sent, ended up sending a check for that. Unfortunately, over the years, the institute it was a reading room, a men's institute, and it became a snooker club. And the men would put too interested in playing snooker rather than to maintain the building. So when I first saw it in 2007, it was derelict oh, wow. and it was closed and not used. Well, I thought it was quite important that this, the first of the Passmore Edwards buildings, was saved. So we had a public meeting in the village and they agreed that they should restore the building and make it into a village hall because there was no, it was just the like local school to go to for the meetings, sitting on those silly little chairs. So uh, it was a good, good project. Unfortunately, it took us until 2014 to raise the money, but I'm sure many of you will remember being in the Institute of Years today. <coughs> 1882, Passmore Edwards wrote to the Royal uh, Infirmary in London, which, in Truro, which was the main Cornwall hospital. And to tell them about this convalescent home, he was building at Perrinport in memory of his mother. And he suggested to the hospital that instead of having a separate board of directors to look after the home, that the hospital should take it over and 
and he offered them £3,000 towards future maintenance and care. Well, obviously, they, they snapped his hand off, thinking the most generous gift ever for them. And this was probably the reason that uh, a couple of years later, he was offered the freedom of the city of Truro, and he was the first person to get that honour. There was only 2,000 children lying the streets from the station down to, to the city centre to welcome him to, to the city. Same year, 1882, the um, Canon Barnet in Whitechapel in London took Edwards to see this library that he was building there. In fact, he'd almost finished the library, but there was a little bit of money needed to finish it off. And he took Edwards to see it, hoping that he would give him a small amount of money just to, to top what that was needed. Well, Edwards went home and there he is, let's get it right. He wrote out a check for £6,454, which was going to cover the total cost of the building. And he offered a thousand books as well to start them off. He said he would most cheerfully comply with your request, not merely from a sense of duty, but because it is a distinguished privilege lightening the lot of our fellow East End citizens. Now he campaigned back in 1850 with William Hewitt MP on public libraries, and they had at that time the Public Libraries Act. But even in London, progress in opening libraries had been very slow. Now, one of the problems was that the ratepayers in the area, they had to have a vote to impose a penny rate on the ratepayers to maintain the library once it was open. And the ratepayers were most often the most affluent and the most educated people in town. And they couldn't see the sense of educating the working classes, so they wouldn't agree. Edwards thought different and he offered a thousand books to every library that opened in London. He used to give more than 80,000 books to libraries at this time. The library was built in an area of London that at that time was the home of a lot of Jewish immigrants. So the library very quickly became known as the University of the Ghetto. It, was, it had the biggest collection of Jewish books of any library in the country. And in the first year, over 2,000 uh, people uh, registered to be members. And for many of them, this was their only means of education. They hadn't got access to schooling, so they went to the library where they could get books and help themselves to read and write. Amongst those first members was Isaac Rosenberg. Now, he's a very famous poet that died on the Somme in the First World War. And if you've ever been to Coventry and seen Coventry Cathedral, this is the statue of St. Michael, which is uh, made by Jacob, Jacob Epstein, a famous sculptor. And for some few in the audience that are old enough to remember the chapter, Jacob Bronowski on the Ascent of Man TV program on the BBC. He was also one of the early members. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's admitted that. <laughs> Some years later, Canon Barnett wanted to open an art gallery in the area, again for the local people. So again, he went to Passmore Edwards for help, and Edwards gave him £4,000 towards the building and a thousand pounds to help buy the land. So the Whitechapel Gallery was built uh, adjacent to the library and opened in 1901. Two, was it like 250,000 people went to the first exhibition. So these two buildings, the library on this side and the art gallery on that side, quite interesting because one is one of the first buildings, and one is one of the last buildings of Passmore Records. And the period of time 
in between those two buildings, it was like remorseless, everlasting giving by Pascal. In a single day, he laid the foundation stone of the library in Hicksfield Street in Oxton. And in the afternoon, he was at Haggerston laying the foundation stone of an extension to their library. He had already built them the library, it wasn't big enough. And after he opened the Shepherd's Bush Library, he then walked across town to Hammersmith, where he let, um, unveiled the drinking fountain uh, in memory of his brother uh, Richard, who had been a, a vestryman, an older man at that time. You can just see it there with the mantle on it, which just looks like a mountain for its drinking fountain. Would that still be up and working? Unfortunately, not. It's, about 12 months later, a young child ran across the road to get a drink and was knocked down. Oh. And they said it was unsafe and they moved it huh? uh, to outside the library, actually. But then it was bombed in the wall, so it was destroyed. Uh, but this is one of probably a dozen drinking fountains that he funded through a group, which is called the Metropolitan Public Drinking Fountain and Cattle Drop Association, <laughs> which is still active today, actually. And you can find their cattle plots still about, even in Cornwall. Right. Now, Pastor Edwards' working day started well before seven o'clock. He'd be at his desk at seven o'clock every morning, and he'd be there again at seven o'clock at night um, when the papers were out on the streets being sold. And his only holidays seemed to be when he was gone to open the building or lay a foundation stone, either one of his own buildings or other people asked him to open uh, their own buildings as well. And uh, in May 1895, he came down to Cornwall and he opened or laid foundation stones for five buildings in just the one week. First of all, this guy, this is their cottage hospital, and the foundation stone was laid by Lord Mount Edgecombe, who was the uh, chief master Freemason of Cornwall at that time. So all the Freemasons gathered in long procession through the town in their full regalia, and after them came the odd fellows, and after them came the buffaloes, and after them came the aldermen, the brass bands and the military and anybody else who thought they were to be there processed through the town to the site where the convalescent home was being built. On Tuesday, he came down here to Newman, where he laid the foundation stone for the Newman Art Gallery. I'm sure you came past that on the way this morning. Now, there was a Red Root architect uh, who developed the plans for the building, but the architects in Newman they, they had their own ideas of what they wanted. They, first of all, they got rid of the reading room because uh, they wanted more gallery space. Uh, but the second thing was this carved frieze across the front of the building. Uh, and that was changed to these four beaten copper plaques representing earth, wind, fire, and water, which were designed and made in Munich. And Newlyn was very famous for this, which is called the Crusade work, and Newlyn was very famous for its copper work at that time. The gallery was dedicated to John Oakley, the Cornish artist. So although you'll see Pat John Passmore Edwards' name over the door of many of his buildings, he preferred to dedicate them either to family members or other great people. What was his name again, please? Sorry. John Oakley. Oakley. O-P-R-E. Chase Water Institute that was dedicated to Edward's brother um, James, who had gone to Australia and died there. Uh, the Liscard Library was dedicated to the local MP Charles Buller, and the Launston Library was dedicated to a chap called. Coach Adams, who was a great mathematician and astronomer, and discovered the uh, Neptune, the planet Neptune. There was also many of these um, 
bronze plaques and uh, marble bursts. This is Richard Trevelyan's bust, which is in Campbell. Now. On Wednesday, it was Basil Redwood's son, Harry, that opened the Campbell Library uh, with um, Sylvanus Travail as the architect. Now, Campbell was one of those towns that originally said that they couldn't afford a library, then voted against it. But when Edwards came along and said he would, well, he would pay for the building, obviously they changed their mind. In the afternoon, he was in Redruth opening their library. And after that, there was games on the red, and there was a carnival, and there was a, a dinner for the toffs, and there was a cream tea for the, uh, the other people. <laughs> the other. It's going to be a theatre now, it is. Yeah. 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 I went to the first performance. Oh. And we store we store all our beer there at the moment. Finally on Thursday he was in Truro, where he opened or made foundation stone for the Truro Free Library. But that wasn't the end of his week because he was back in London on Friday opening somebody else's library. Mm -hmm. The <laughs> the gift of this little cottage hospital in Falmouth was enough for the uh, borough council to offer him the uh, freedom of the borough. And uh, 1893 was when they presented him with this, and he stayed at the Falmouth Hotel. And they all paraded from the hotel down into town to for the ceremony. And again, all the children lined up the streets to welcome. And after the ceremony, of course, there was a big dinner. And after the big dinner, there would be the speeches and the votes of thanks. And Edward said that Cornwall, of course, is almost surrounded by water. And he would like to, he had the idea, he would like to build a lighthouse. And he wanted to build it here on the Manicor, which is a very dangerous stretch of coast. And he wanted to dedicate this lighthouse to John Couch Adams, the astronomer and to the discoverer of Neptune. And he wanted to build a similar lighthouse on the coast of France and dedicate that to Le Verrier, who was the joint discoverer of Neptune. And Edward said that, I'm getting in front of myself. Edward said that these two sister lighthouses might complacently glance at each other and mutually promote a friendly feeling between two sister nations, England and France. Well, the council said they'd rather have a library. <laughs> 1896, Edwards presided over the annual dinner of the Cornishman in London, and Lord Mount Edgecombe was there as the guest of honour. And Edwards told Mount Edgecombe, he said, send a message back to the towns of Cornwall, if all the major towns, if they would build a library, or if they would pass the Free Library Act and accept the penny rate, then I will build them a library. Well, St. Ives got on with it, and he very quickly had this beautiful building, very much in use today. It's a bit built up round about nowadays, but it's still a very impressive building. In Penryn, the town council debated it, and they decided that the penny rate was only going to raise £30, and that wasn't enough to maintain the library. But they didn't go back and tell him, they didn't thank him, they just ignored it. At St. Hostel, they decided that, again, the penny rate wasn't enough to maintain the library. But if they joined up with the, the rural area, which was the most affluent because of all the mining, they could have a library between them. Unfortunately, the people that lived in the rural area, they thought that this is, was just St. Austin Town trying to get a library at their expense and they wouldn't agree. And it was 60 years before St. Austin got its own library. In 
helps them, they said, well, we've already got a library, but can we have a school? And he agreed, and this is their science and art school in uh, Penrose Road, a very nice cafe there if you go along. It's an art centre, um, very, very well run there. In this card, again, they just got on with the job. They started work in February, and by Christmas, they were finished and it was open. Now, in Launceston, it was another matter. Although they said they wanted a library, the town council couldn't agree where it was going to go. Every member of the town council seemed to have his own idea of where the library should go, and so the discussions just went on and on. And eventually Edwards wrote to them and said, look, I'm not getting any young, you know, and there's other people that want my money. So if you want a library, just get on with it. Newton Abbott, I think this is their most beautiful building in Newton Abbott. It's two buildings, in fact. It's the Passmore Edwards Library and the uh, Arts and Science School. Both buildings built or designed by Sylvanus Travail, former charter. Now, the library was dedicated to Passmore Edwards' mother. You'll remember she was born in New Nabbit. And so, on the day when they were going to open or to lay the foundation stones, they had a public holiday and they had lots of decorations throughout the town. And uh, just wait a minute. Yeah, they made a great day of it, and of course they had a big dinner, and they had the speeches, and the votes of thanks, and everything like that. And Edward stood up to give his vote of thanks, or to respond to the vote of thanks, and he started to talk about his connection with Newton Abbott, saying, his mother had been born there. And he said, I remember my dear mother. And at that point, he just went quiet. He couldn't say anything. He, he just froze. And he was so upset. And he sat down. And in fact, he left. He went back to London on the next train. He was so upset. Now, the completion of the building was delayed. First of all, the builder went broke. And then Sylvanus Travail died. So it was two years before the library and the school were, were finished. And again, the, the town council wanted to make a day of it. So there was a day's holiday. It was all the banners up again. And they decided that they were going to have a procession. And they were going to start at the railway station. And then they would process through the town, past the house where Passmore Edward's mother had been born to where the library was. And on the morning, everybody was gathered at the railway stations with their gold chains and their long robes. And it was just an hour before they were due to start off when a telegram came to say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be with you today. Now this was from Passmore Records. He didn't give a reason. Now I know the week before, he'd been at the parent for the convalescent home. But he quite often stayed there, he used it like a hotel when he was born. Always left him a £20 note when he, when he left. So was it illness that kept him away? Or was it he just couldn't face the memories of his mother uh, being brought back again? Many of his buildings, unfortunately, are no longer used for the purpose for which they were originally given. And unfortunately, this one at Limehouse remained boarded up and neglected for many years after it was closed in 2004. And it was only about a year ago that it was reopened, uh, restored, and reopened. Now it's a, it's a boutique hotel. Others were lucky in when with the uh, Whitechapel Library closed, it was turned into an extension to the Art Gallery. So if you're in London, you go and have a look at that. And in this guard, the, the cottage hospital, that was closed and was going to be pulled down, but the town council stepped in and stopped it being pulled down 
and now it's part of a uh, sheltered housing and uh, old people's home. The probably the smallest of the Bastmore Edwards buildings is this little Institute of Midian, which is just outside Blackwater. The people of Midian, they wanted their own uh, institute, and in fact, they started saving and they started building, but they ran out of money when the walls were just about this high. And somebody suggested writing to Pastor Edwards and asking for help. And his response was to send John Simmons around there to finish the job. His only comment was, if you'd asked me earlier, I would have built you a bigger building. <laughs> in London, I think his most beautiful building is this in Bloomsbury. Now this is Passmore Edwards settlement. And the idea of the settlement at that time was that men and women that had been to, to university would go and live in four areas. And the people that lived round about would have use of the settlement building. It would be a creche, it would be gymnasium, it would be uh, classes, it would be the use of a free solicitor or free banking. And, uh, the, and the settlers would also teach what we might call life skill classes to the residents as well. And Edwards was very interested in this self-help idea. And he offered uh, 4,000 pounds towards the building. But the Mary Ward, the famous novelist, uh, it was her idea. And she had a way of sort of twisting Passmore Edwards around her little finger. And he eventually ended up giving £14,000 to us. And he was forever sending cheques for £20 or £50 to pay for an ongoing running costs or for her latest idea. Now, right at the end of the day, you'll see uh, the first school for invalids in the country was built at that uh, settlement. And it's often said that the play school, the, uh, the play school movement was started at the that's more Edward's settlement. Ellen was married, uh, Edwards was married, it's his wife Eleanor, and uh, she took a great deal of attention to the work that he was doing as well. And they were both involved with Charing Cross Hospital in London. He was on the development board and she was on the Ladies Guild. And the Ladies Guild were fundraisers and they also made garments and bedding for the hospital. And of course, the hospital, they, they wanted a convalescent home. And of course, Edward said that if they could find the land, he would build them one. But finding land at that time for convalescent homes wasn't easy because they were generally out in the country outside the towns near to the big country estates. And the landowners didn't want convalescent homes next to their country. They didn't want these poor people coming out of London, just even just for a fortnight or so, and onto their country estate. So whenever there was a suitable site, uh, they would either go to the auction and outbid everybody else, or they would go to the seller and do a private deal. Now Edwards heard of the bad piece of land, and he went to the auction, and he sat on the front row, and he didn't turn around in case somebody recognised him, and he bid for and bought a piece of land, which turned out to be the Mintzfield convalescent home. In, uh, so, in Herne Bay, he, bought, he built a convalescent home for the Friendly Societies and right next door, a convalescent home for the Railway Men's Workers' Union. 1880 had seen the foundation of the uh, National Society for the Employment of Epileptics. This is so that people with epilepsy at that time, if they were capable of work, they couldn't get work because they because they've got epilepsy. And quite often they found themselves in the poorhouse, in the workhouse, or even in the asylum for the people with mental illnesses. Now Edwards found this farm, 100 acre farm, and gave it to the society where they could provide a place where people could both live and work in safety. And the centre of Chalford St. Peter is still the headquarters of the Society for uh, National Society for Epilepsy. Edward stayed 
if you remember, I said he, he stayed connected to his people that he gave money to, and he became vice president of the society and re remained with them the rest of his life. But over a number of years, he built eight or funded eight buildings for them where people would live and work. And there was also the administration office of the society. That's just some of the 70 buildings. He also worked with the Metropolitan Public Gardens Association in London, paying for laying out uh, public gardens in working class areas, recognizing that working people had very few hours of recreation and they deserved somewhere where they could rest as much as the rich man. It's um, It's difficult to guess just how many people have benefited from what I call the Passmore Edwards legacy. There's obviously thousands and thousands of people that obtained hospital treatment at one of his hospitals, or learned to read and write at one of his many libraries, or learned to trade at his arts and science schools. And at Camberwell, they still do. And hundreds of thousands of people went for two weeks at one of the convalescent homes or one of the children's holiday homes. Men like this at the Herne Bay convalescent home, they sent home postcards to their families to show just how well they were being treated. And these children from the East End of London sent to Clapton just for two weeks of good food and fresh air. And hundreds have lived and worked at Chalford St. Peter. It's not surprising that both Queen Victoria and King Edward offered him a knighthood, and he turned them both down, saying he would prefer to say to be as he was. As he approached his 88th year at his home in Hampstead, his health began to fail. Um, but even in his last days, he longed to get better. My work's not yet done, he told a friend. But unfortunately, uh, his time was coming to an end and he was drifting in and out of a coma. When he was there. It's not emotions, it's just the <laughs> He was drifting in and out of a coma. Where's my mother, he said. In heaven, said his wife. Would you like to go to her? Yes, I would, he said. By his bedside was that gold watch inscribed with the words presented to Passmore Edwards by friends who have an especial and unusual occasion to testify their appreciation of his integrity and uprightness. Beside it was a bookmark embroidered by his mother with the words, Susan Edwards, your affectionate mother, born March the 14th, 1786. May you be happy, blessed, and free from every ill. Goodbye. This simple bookmark had been kept in his books all his adult life, ever since he'd left Blackwater those years ago to find his fame and fortune. So peacefully, he passed away. The Times newspaper wrote, he did more good in his time than almost any other of his contemporaries. Just a few words, I think, to sum up the life of a great Cornishman. Thank you. Anybody want to ask any questions? Well, there's one question about Whitechapel thing. Now that the massive hospital there, is that not part of the hospital further down the road from the Whitechapel? East Ham. Yeah. He built a, he paid for an extension to a hospital in, in West Ham. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. 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 Was his wife quite involved? Sorry? Was his wife quite involved? Well, as I say, it's, <coughs> she was involved. 
Um, when the parents bought Tom Lesson's home, it was built, she came down with the daughter, Ada, and they sorted out all the furnishings and curtains. So isn't that quite unusual at the time for a woman to be able to I think, yes, yes. take sort of responsibility for mm. things? And when the family of the cottage hospitals, again, she kept, went down there and she sort of gave all the bedding and the things that we needed. Similarly, from their experience that she gained at the Charing Cross Hospital in the later year, got more than that. And, so and, uh, and when he was running his newspapers, they used to, every year, they would send hundreds of youngsters out into the country, they'd uh, hire a train and they'd go out collecting forests with hundreds of youngsters on and uh, Ada organised that as well. So it must have been quite a, you know, couldn't do it today. Mm -hmm. I don't know when they lost any, but <laughs> they would have a whole train for them to go out into the countryside today. Mm -hmm. And she would organise that. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that you have spent some money from well, as I say, those two magazines were the base of his wealth. And then when he sold, like when he sold up, as he got older, he sold the London Airplane. And that money went into the pot to give away. About 90% of his personal wealth was there. Yeah. I wonder whether he had any stocks and shares. <laughs> Opposite well, of Rupert Murdoch, there, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Giving it all away. <laughs> well, at the time, um, inflation was very quite stable. And people put their money, or he put the money into guilds today, consoles they were called. So they they were about three percent. So it was fairly constant. Yeah. Uh, so it was somewhere to put your money in, just to hold it. Not he, he criticised people that used their money to invest abroad instead of investing in buying building houses for people in this country. The money should be spent if you earn your wealth here. You should spend it here on promoting um, health in this country. Jim can't clone him for today, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, a few yeah. men like that. That's, that's why I'm not so obvious. Yeah. 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 You need people like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think because he wasn't, he, he was able to have that world, well, almost felt world view, not having very much education really, did he? No. It's just no. self educated. Yeah. yeah, so it's a unique. Yeah. Self-made man, isn't it? To yeah. form the kind of philanthropic, um, almost utopian uh, visions, and to actually have the skill or delegation skill to yeah. see it through. It was massive. He, he didn't really delegate. No, he held on true. tightly to every single project. Every single project was written to him personally. He yeah. funded it personally. He went down, he laid the bricks, didn't he? He kept in touch with them. Yeah. That's what's so extraordinary. Yeah. It was all yeah. through him. Yeah. He suggested the architects and built the He wanted it. And the buildings like Red Roof by William Campbell, they cost in those days two and a half thousand pounds for the And they came in at that price. They weren't well over the budget like we get today. You know, wow. they were winning pounds. Yeah. In fact, when the, the Red Roof Library, they wanted to build a wall at the front. And he says, well, I'm not paying for that. So he's only that, and I'll pay for the library. We can build the wall myself. They kept total, tight control on it. Very authoritative in that way. One of his employees said he was a very hard test. Mm -hmm. What about his family, surviving families? How did they feel last week? No, no. Um, his son, uh, who inherited the business, he was more interested in playing golf. His wife said that he was huge and had a bedroom room to see him play with his toys. So he was off the golf club. And his daughter married an industrialist and they went to live in Scotland. I've been in touch with lots of the descendants, so they, you know, we do talk to them. And uh, I've, I've got them in touch with them, members of families. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but have any of them got any interest or connections still? They haven't got any, work? as far as I know, they haven't got any philanthropic uh, interests. 
But back in 2011, when it was 100 years after Edward's died, and there were events going on there, we had a service in Truro Cathedral, which was around about the time when we received his reading of the, of the book. And uh, we had a procession through the town with the service, and there was 18 members of his family gathered. Uh, so all, I'm saying the ones that have survived since then, I'm still in touch with them. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. Lighters. Well, the lighthouse would have been on, on the coast. Unfortunately, they, they turned it down and said they didn't want the lighthouse. But only two or three years after that, there was a ship. That picture was of a ship that had gone around there and lots of people had been killed. And then the stories in the newspaper were reminding people that Passmore Edmund had offered to build the lighthouse there. And that made a lot of happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I'll turn off the live stream now. Thanks.